Let's stand together as we sing this song.
shelter of the Most High, will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I am trusting in him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from the fatal plague. He will shield you with his wings. He will shelter you with his feathers. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor fear the dangers of the day, nor dread, dread the plague that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you, but you will see it with your eyes. You will see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. Amen. No plague will come near your dwelling, for he orders his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you with their hands to keep you from striking your foot on a stone. You will trample down lions and poisonous snakes. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. Amen. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them, and I will satisfy them with a long life and give them my salvation. Amen.
is a new experience for me, so I'm excited about this. If I like it very well, I may try it ever Sunday. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you think about the human condition, the human predicament that we're in, if you really were to think about it from a biblical perspective, you would almost despair. You think, first of all, the Bible tells us that we're all sinners. And then not just sinners, but as far as spiritual things are concerned, we're blind, we're deaf, we, we just have no connection with God. In fact, the Bible describes it as being dead. Amen. You who were dead in trespassing and sin. So that's about as, as a bleak as you can get. And then even after we become a Christian, we're still very weak, aren't we? But even the Apostle Paul, probably the greatest Christian that maybe ever lived, I don't know, certainly one of the greatest Christians that ever lived, he talked about how that he said it's when I'm weak that God's strength is actually demonstrated in my life. So, so we are in a predicament as, as human beings in this world. How could, we could never save ourselves, could we? There's no way that I can make myself right with God there. Most of the religions of the world have this idea that, well, if I do enough good things, then maybe God will, uh, if he's in a good mood on that particular day, if I do more good things than bad things, maybe God will let me in. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Amen. In fact, the Bible teaches that it only takes one sin, unforgiven, only one uh, disobedient act to disqualify us from fellowship with the Holy God. Amen. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Yeah. So, so how, what, what hope do we have? What hope do you and I have that we can ever live in heaven with God forever? And what hope do we have that he can live in us in this life? Well, it's not based on us. Amen. If the hope was based on us, we would be hopeless. Amen. But because he is our hope, uh, that we do have hope. And uh, I just, this uh, last week, I've been... Uh, I wanted to finish up the book of Jude. I know I've said the last three weeks this is my last sermon in the book of Jude, but I haven't been able to get through with it. But, uh, but we're, we're looking at the last two verses in Jude today, one of the great uh, doxologies in the Bible. And it just reminds me that God is able. God is able. All morning long this morning, I've been singing a little chorus that says, What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. Aren't you thankful that God is almighty? That He is able to do what we could never do. In fact, our salvation, if it were left up to us, nobody would be saved. Amen. If, we, if we had to try to save ourselves by our good works and by our human efforts, nobody would be saved. Amen. But God is able. And I want us to look at some verses in the Bible today that talks about God being able. Uh, before we get to Jude, uh, the last two, I want you to look at, at Romans chapter 16, verse 25. I just, I just, I just typed in, uh, God is able. God is able. And just some verses probably. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. So he says God is able to strengthen you according to the gospel that I have preached. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, and God is able to make all grace, listen to all the alls in here, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. He says, God is just lavishing upon you blessings to make you able to do what he is able to do. God is able to make all grace abound. Then Ephesians 3.20. Uh, now to him who is able 
to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power and work within us to him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. He says he is able to do more than you can even ask or think. That's the God that we serve. And then Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 tells us he is able to help those who are being tempted. When you're being tested, when you're brought under a trial of some kind, it says for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to to help those who are being tempted or being tested. And then, uh, and then the passage that I really want to focus in on today, the last two verses in the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25 of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. What a wonderful way for you to conclude this little postcard that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. Just one little chapter in the, in the Bible. And he starts off in with a greeting, he said, verses 1 and 2, he just talks, he says, grace to you, and uh, hello to all the people. And then there's a sense of urgency, verse 3. He said, I wanted to write to you about how wonderful it is to be saved, but I found it necessary, so urgent, that I write to you uh, and, and appeal to you to contend earnestly for the faith. He says, there are enemies sneaking in to the church, and there are enemies that want to destroy you, mislead you, and, uh, and, and I am writing to caution you. And he gives this warning, verses 4 through 7. He talks about warning us about these uh, false teachers that come to the church. We've said the last few weeks that uh, the world hates the church. There's no doubt about it. Satan hates the church. But the world can never actually destroy the church. Because Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church and the very gates of hell will be able to prevail against it. And, and I just want you to know that even though the world hates the church and the world may persecute the church and has persecuted the church and is persecuting the church in many places and may yet persecute the church, where the church has been threatened and persecuted, it has always thrived. The world itself cannot do uh, ultimate damage to the church. And Satan himself cannot do ultimate damage to the church. But the danger that the church faces is when false teachings come from within the church. And when error begins to be implanted alongside truth and people begin to believe wrongly, that's when they begin to behave wrongly and that's when they begin to lose the joy and the strength that God has has for us. And so he gives a description of these false teachers. We've looked at that. He talks about the judgment that's coming on these false teachers. And then he closes the, the book verses 17 through 25 at, telling us to remember and to remain faithful and to rescue those who are, are being led astray and then finally to rest in the grace and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the book of Jude starts with an assurance that we are being kept by the power of God, and it closes with an assurance that God is going to keep those who belong to Him. Wouldn't it be awful if you had to try to keep yourself? You think about it. You know, I just think about Noah and the ark and everything. Wouldn't it have been terrible if God had said to Noah, now I'm going to put up a bunch of pegs on the outside of the ark and I want you to grab hold and you just hang on and you try to hang on until the flood subsides. That'd be kind of a sad situation. But I don't know, some people might have Ham or Shem or Japheth might have hung on a little longer than Noah, but none of them would have held on forever. And I tell you, you can't hold on forever either. But the Bible teaches that it's not 
what we hold on to, but it's who is holding on to us that gives us security. He has kept us. Jesus said to his disciples and to us that uh, we are in his hand and no one can ever pluck, the, pluck us out of his hand. I'm so thankful that we are kept by the power of God. And so he tells us to remember. He says, remember that I told you ahead of time that the apostles told you that false teachers were going to come so you shouldn't be surprised. And then he says, but you, this was the message we looked at last week. It was always sermon last week. We talked about how important it is for us to build ourselves up on our most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit and remaining faithful to God. So, and then he tells us to, to reach out and to try to rescue other people who are being led astray. Most of you know some people that uh, uh, have been uh, misled and uh, discouraged and maybe even uh, led astray by false teaching. And he tells us how important it is for us to reach out to them. But then he comes to the last two verses and he tells us, and now to him who is able to keep you, keep you, not just keep you safe, but to keep you from slipping or from stumbling. I was looking at some uh, video clips this morning that I pulled up on YouTube of uh, mountain goats. Have you ever seen these mountain goats? It's amazing how they can just jump from crag to crag and their foot never slips. And even from the time they're born, I mean the little baby mountain goats, this one thing I was looking at it said they start learning how to uh, be sure-footed from the very beginning. Just fascinating. I watched two or three little uh, clips of these mountain goats. Some of them even walking up on the sides of things that look like there's no nothing to just even stand on. And I just thought as I was watching that, that's what God is saying here to us. He is able to keep us from slipping. He's able to keep us from stumbling and falling. Now, I'm not able to keep myself. And I would not want to depend on myself. Amen. Apostle Paul makes it clear that, that he didn't even, he said, my, my sufficiency is not of myself. It is in Christ Amen. alone. And so he says that uh, he's able to keep you from stumbling and then next he's able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory. There's going to come a day when God is going to, to bring you into his presence. And what will that be like? Well, I tell you what, if you're trying to to work for your own salvation, if you're trying to be good enough, if you're trying to, to uh, uh, save yourself, when he presents you before himself, it will not be a pleasant day. You will be under condemnation. Amen. But because he has saved you, he has washed you clean with the blood of Jesus, he will be able to present you without fault or without blemish. When I read that sometimes, I think, boy, I don't often feel that I'm without fault or without blemish. You ever feel like, uh, well, I've just got it all together. Man, I, I, don't, I don't have any flaws. I don't have any faults. I don't have any blemishes. Well, again, if we're looking at ourself to be pleasing to God in ourself, then... We couldn't be presented blameless. Amen. But he will present us blameless because there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Those for whom Jesus has died. The Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And there will come a day when you will be presented before him and you'll be presented without flaw, without fault, without sin, totally blameless. Not because you have been perfect, but because he has been perfect. Amen. And he has given to you that perfection, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
The Bible says that God made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin for us. Amen. That's wonderful in itself that he took our sin, but even if he took our sin, that would not give us the right to enter into heaven. Because to enter into heaven, we have to not only not have sin on our account, we have to actually have perfect righteousness on our account. And so that verse says that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us in order that we might be given the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. And uh, again, that's not something that we uh, uh, subjectively and emotionally always feel. But the Bible declares that it's true. Amen. That if I have put my trust in Jesus Christ and I have received Him as my Savior and Lord, that He receives me as His spotless, forgiven, righteous Son, clothed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. And so He says, He will present you before His glory in the presence of His glory with great joy. Um, as I've studied this, I thought, does that mean that I'll have great joy? No doubt I will have great joy. But I believe He is the one who has great joy. I believe that it's great joy for God to welcome us into His presence. The Bible says that uh, uh, when Jesus told the story about the prodigal son, about the lost sheep and the lost coin. He talks about how that the, the shepherd who's lost his sheep, he searches till he finds it and he brings it back and then he calls his family and friends together and he says rejoice with me for I have found my sheep which was lost. Amen. And he says I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 who need no repentance. Amen. And I believe that God is the one who rejoices. Um, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament is Zephaniah 3.17. It says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He is mighty to save. And he will rejoice over you with gladness or with joy. He will rest in his love and he will exult over you with loud singing. Isn't that a great verse? God who is in our midst he is a mighty one and he says he will save and will rejoice over you with joy. Amen. The picture here says this word for exult is a a Hebrew word that means to dance and to spin around. Have you ever gotten so excited about something that you just had to jump up and down and spin around? Yeah. Uh, you see that a lot of times whenever a ball team wins uh, in the last minute or two of the game, you know, people are just acting almost ridiculous. But this says that God himself will exult over us. It's the idea of God just jumping up and down and spinning around saying that I brought my children home to be with me Amen. forever. And uh, we will rest, he will rest in his love and joy over thee with singing. Uh, when our kids were little, I'd put them to bed at night. I would uh, sometimes sing over them and uh, sing to them. I think they may have thought that was punishment, I don't know, but I, but I would, would sing over them, sing a lullaby or something like that, but I have to do the same. And I get that picture here, that God sings over us. He rejoices over us. And he says, these are the ones that I have purchased with my own blood. These are the ones that I have brought to myself these are the ones that I have indwelled by my Holy Spirit. And these are the ones that will spend all of eternity with me rejoicing in my great salvation. And I just ask you this question today. Have you, have you done that? 
Have you put your trust in Jesus? Um, the Bible makes it clear that you are a sinner and that the wages of sin is death. There's absolutely no hope apart from the grace of God Amen. for anybody to ever stand in the presence of a holy God. The whole book of Romans is about how God can, in some way or another, take ruined sinners and make them able to stand in his presence. The Lord. And he does that by sending his own son to die for our sin and then giving us the grace and the faith to believe that Jesus died for me. And when you really believe that, when you really believe that, it changes your life. Amen. It, it changes your past because all your sins are forgiven. It changes your present because now you're in you with the power to live for Christ and it changes your future and it gives to you the absolute certainty that you will live with Him forever. So let's pray and then I want to give you an invitation Come and put your trust in Jesus if you've never done that. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this little book of Jude that starts off with assurance that we are kept by our great God and it closes with the assurance. It's just a, a, a security sandwich here with uh, uh, being kept on both sides. But I pray that you will help us never take for granted that we are saved just because we're church members or just because we try to live a decent life. But help us to truly, genuinely turn from ourself and from our sin. Yes. Believe with all our heart that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins and then by faith welcome him into our life so that he might give to us not just eternal life, but with joyful celebration, bring us into his presence uh, in, the, in the ages to come. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to sing a song that just says, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. And if you've not done that, if you have not, Put your trust in Jesus. I ask you today to come and say, I want to trust in the Lord with all my heart and be saved. As we stand together and as we sing.
Carter is going to play an offertory for us. You can prepare your offering. The offering box is out in the foyer, and you can put that in as you bring so Jackson.
encourage you both in body and in spirit. And then, Father, for uh, Emmanuel, I pray that you uh, uh, meet his needs. We're not even certain exactly what they are. Yes. But we know that you know, and I pray that you will help, uh, help him at this time of struggle in his life. And I pray, Father, for you to use uh, the, your word, yes, yes. even the one we looked at today, to encourage us, to strengthen us, and to secure, to know that we have eternal security if we have truly put our genuine trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and have been born again. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And by the way, no service this evening. We're not having an evening service today. So let's...